Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading, and this is one of the most iconic muzzleloaders I've ever had the fortunate opportunity to share with you. This right here is an S. Hawkins signed full stock percussion rifle with a 36 inch full octagon barrel. The barrel tapers from 1.11 inches at the breech to one inch at the muzzle and has seven groove rifling. Jacob and Samuel Hawken are among the most famous makers of American muzzleloaders and were active together in St. Louis starting in 1825. They have long been associated with the 19th century mountain men and their early rifles are known to have been used by the mountain men active in the fur trade in the 1830s, including by General William Henry Ashley and the American Fur Company. Many of their rifles, including this one, date to after the heyday of the Rocky Mountain fur trade when Hawken rifles continued to be in demand, including by former fur trappers like Jim Bridger and Kit Carson, who found new work as hunters, guides, and scouts. While the Hawken shop was best known for its half stock rifles, they continued to build full stock American long rifle style rifles, which some customers prefer and they were also offered at lower prices. $18 for a full stock versus $25 for the more labor intensive half stocks. This rifle is dated to sometime in the 1850s and is typical of the full stock Hawken rifles manufactured by the famous Hawken shop in St. Louis. As far as muzzle loaders go, there's not a whole lot that is as popular or as well known as the Hawk and rifle. Whether you were interested in muzzle loading from early periods, you know, American long rifle and before, or the 19th century and beyond, the Hawk and rifle is known by just about anybody and everybody, in large part thanks to a lot of the popular media of the mid 20th century, but it is still nonetheless just incredible to have the opportunity to look at a Hawken rifle. I've been playing with and building some of the mass market Hawken kits that are out there. And something that I always wanted as I was working on those kits was to be able to see an original Hawken rifle and study it. And I'm just a little, <laughs> A gape here that I have that opportunity. It's very rare that we see an original Hawken come through anywhere other than private collections shown amongst friends or, or in museums. So um, I hope, really hope to do this justice. If you are like me and interested in some of the measurements of this particular piece and how it associates with the piece as a whole, the first link in the video description is going to take you to ilovemuzzling.com. We'll have a lot of photographs of this piece with a ruler for you to take notes from and better understand. I'm doing that on a lot of the pieces that we're seeing this time around just because we don't see them very often. And uh, if this is one of the opportunities that we all get to see an original Hawken, I want to make sure that we get as much out of it as we can. With all of that out of the way, let's start at the butt and work our way forward. Just wow, you know, it's in great condition, um, you know, for what you'd expect a Hawken to be in. We don't see very many of these, and this is the first original that I've seen personally with my own two eyes. So um, back here at the butt, we have our classic iron curved butt plate here. We have a large screw at the center of the top and we have a screw down towards the toe at the rear of our butt plate. The butt plate itself is rather plain. Despite the American long rifle influences, uh, we don't have any of those influences really on this butt plate where we would typically see facets or borders. It's a smooth round across the top and the same goes for across the back. The butt stock itself is a rather simple long rifle shape or, or 19th century muzzleloader shape here. We have a nice defined crest. We have a drop from the barrel and the tang down to the heel of our butt plate here. You can see here in the butt stock, like we see in many other original Hawkins, at least in the photographs of them, we do have some wear and some discoloration, 
we have a, a pretty white or light streak coming through the wrist here, presumably where this was carried and worn in the hand, as well as along the crest of the cheek where this might have rested in a shooter's uh, you know, face, really. But we have some dark stains here through the stock, denoting some use and some wear over time. Just really lovely organic colors in there. On the underside of our buttstock or the toe here, you can see a really dark discoloration on this piece. And there is a significant amount of wear on this toe, something that we don't see a whole lot. There are a lot of scratches and grooves in this stock. I just wanna make note of because it's interesting for the provenance of the Hawken rifle. Back here at the toe, we have our Hawken styled toe plate where it's largely rectangular, but we have a nice even curve to a rounded point at the front of the toe plate. The toe plate itself is held on with two screws pretty equally spaced from either end of our toe plate. As we move forward through that worn area, we come up to our iron trigger guard here and our trigger plate assembly. Our trigger guard at the tail end has an almost identical finial to the front end of our trigger plate, something that I've not seen in many of the mass market Hawken kits that are available today, apart from probably the Hawken shop being the, uh, you know, the variance or the difference there. The trigger guard itself is held in in two places. We have a single flathead screw back here at the tail just forward of that finial. And then forward here in front of the main bow, we have the end of a bolt that I believe to be one of our barrel tang bolts from the top of the rifle. Inside our primary bow here, we have a set trigger at the rear, our primary trigger at the front with a trigger adjustment screw here behind our primary trigger to adjust the weight or the pull of our main trigger here. Coming up through our wrist where the muzzleloader would be held, we have a rather long tang that extends from the breech or bolster end of our barrel here back almost to the crest. This tang is held in with two large bolts like we've previously mentioned that go through and mount to the trigger plate or the trigger guard plate beneath the stock. Moving forward, we have our carved or refined lock plate mortise here on our lock plate side. This wood has a slight curve to it as it steps down into the stock. Many of the edges all around this piece are rather smooth. These aren't crisp lines, at least in the transfer from one face to another. Um, I think in part due to how they were made, but also just in part to these being used and cleaned and carried for years and years and years. We see that wood wear down and change over time in many original arms like this Hawken. The lock here looks to me to be a rather classic Hawken style lock. It is not stamped or marked on the exterior side with a maker's mark. It does, however, have some simple embellishments stamped or engraved into the plate, as well as the hammer here as we come up as we come up to our nipple area here. Now, in some cases, I have seen the area around the nipple here where this is raised up a little bit more than it is on this piece in particular. This looks as if there's been some wear here on the front end of where this nipple rests in the bolster. Again, it does not detract from the piece, but for me personally, at least, it adds to the story of a historic arm like this one. You know, there are types of muzzleloaders that are iconic in American culture and really the Hawk and Rifle and its contemporaries as well have really cemented themselves as a part and a piece of American firearms history, much more than I think what they've considered to be in the past, a transition from the flintlock to the smokeless era. I think really, the percussion lock on the American long rifle and on muzzleloaders in general warrants its own time period and its own appreciation.
So we know based on the documentation for the Hawken shop and their extensive building that this long or fully stocked version would have been a little bit cheaper than the half stock version. So we see some of those money conscious or budget conscious things taken into account here. I think the simplicity of the decoration of the lock is one thing. And I think the lack of ornamentation elsewhere on this piece, specifically our barrel keys here at the front where we have three. In many examples, especially of the half stock percussion Hawken rifles, we have some kind of extension plate here around the barrel keys to protect the stock from the keys themselves. On this Hawken in particular, we don't have that. We just have wood and a key interaction here. No other embellishment or anything on this piece. Coming forward from our bolster in the breech area of this rifle, we have the prominent S. Hawken St. Louis stamp here. And like many photos of the Hawken rifles that I have seen, the stamp is weighted a little bit to the top of the stamp, which makes me think, and based on my experience in the shop, the stamp was angled a little bit forward so that this, the maker could identify where they were on the barrel and then striking the stamp is a little bit deeper on that forward or upper end of the stamp just because of how it was set in. Again, a nice human element to that piece. Stamp itself was used after Jacob's death in 1849. So we believe this particular piece to have been made sometime in the 1850s. In a contemporary sense, we might call this a buckhorn style sight. It's set up so that you have your main sight picture kind of in the lower area here where your notch is. And then on either side, you have an elevated sight that you can line up with your front sight here for a more longer distance shot. So some sights are set up that your main sight level is 50 yards and the horns on either side or 100. And some are set up that your main sight is 100 yards and the horns on either side are 200 yards. On the underside here, as we come up to our entry pipe, we can see, again, the kind of the basic model of this Hawken rifle. Our entry pipe and our ramrod pipes going forward here are rather plain. They are just iron with little to no embellishment. On the front end of our entry pipe on, on, and on either end of our ramrod pipe, we have two simply carved wedding bands here that are just a single line. Again, very budget, very affordable, and very simple and quick for the maker to apply to those pieces. As we come forward here past our three barrel keys, I wanna make a note that typically I have heard that the barrel keys themselves go in from the left through to the right, but on this piece, as it sits with us here today, the keys go from the right to the left. Forward at our muzzle here, we have a sheet iron nose cap protecting the end grain of our forestock. And underneath it, we have a large caliber ramrod with a bone or horn tip applied to the front. That tip is held on with a copper rivet is what it looks like to me. This particular Hawken is a 54 caliber Hawken, and that seems to be a fairly common caliber of rifle for the Hawken shop in the 1850s in St. Louis. It's considered a big boar gun. You could hunt Western big game. You could defend yourself from a grizzly bear or try to at least with something at 54 caliber, but it is a big heavy gun. This is, for lack of a better term, a man's gun. You need to be pretty stout. You need to eat your breakfast to be able to carry this around through the woods and the mountains all day. Starting at our muzzle end and working our way back on this side, you can see the mirror image basically of our lock plate side. We can see the ends of our barrel keys here as they rest, and we can see the other side of our simple ramrod and entry pipes on the underside. As we come back to our side plate mortise, we don't have what we think of as a true side plate. We have a single lock bolt at the upper center of our side plate mortise, and it features a small brass extension that is circular with a small point coming out the bottom, pointing straight down. 
Now, on this side plate here, we can see a little bit of variance in the grain. There's a little bit of it in the forestock in front of the mortise on either side, but still a very simple, very plain grained wood here for this piece. Again, think of budget, think of affordable, think of utilitarian when we start to get into this era of rifle. As we come back here, we can see what many term a Tennessee style cheek rest and the other side of our butt stock here. Very common for the St. Louis area, the Tennessee area, kind of the mid south here in terms of long rifle school and muzzleloader building for the time. We don't have any carving or ornate motifs anywhere on the rear end of this butt stock, but we do have one incised line here cutting through our cheek piece, kind of connecting the lines and the shapes back here from our butt plate up to and through the center of the stock, kind of guiding our eye all the way through this piece. Wow. I mean, for, I would say, the majority of muzzleloading enthusiasts, at least right now in, in 2023 as we're recording, most people that enjoy muzzleloaders in some capacity started out with some kind of Hawken, you know, um, whether that was because of Jeremiah Johnson or the Mountain Man movie or just Thompson Center's marketing campaign. Um, it's just really cool. You know, I'm, I'm among that group. I have a couple of the modern Hawkins and it's just, it's really neat to see what they were um, because it is a name, you know, it is a name in American arms making history. It's not necessarily a name that we hear anymore, you know, like Winchester or Remington or Colt. Um, it's kind of a name that got left behind, but in a way it came back, you know, and I think that's really cool. And I, I know that we can't all have an original Hawken like this one. It'd be cool if we could, um, but it's just really cool it's just really cool to be able to sit down here and, and see and hold this. And, and I hope that I've done the presentation here to you at home a little bit of justice on seeing what an original Hawken is like. Um, like I said, I'll have pictures with measurements and things at ilovemuzzleloading.com if you are interested in further studying the Hawken rifle. Um, or if you're like me and you just think it's fun to take one of the kits that's available today and, and play with it and, and do what you can to match it up with something that's original. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this unique piece of American arms making history with you. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more high quality photos and videos about historic arms like this one, or for this one, check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages for more high quality photos and videos. They're publishing a ton of stuff here. And the team here is really passionate about sharing these pieces and making them available as they can, as they kind of pass through the halls here. So I really thank them for the opportunity to bring this to you at home. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.